This will be episode two for the adventure of the Bible. And the purpose of this series is to get you to realize that the Bible is so much more than you think it is. A lot of people think it's just black words on white paper. I think it's just something that sits around on grandma's bookshelf, on grandma's coffee table, something that their grandma reads. But it should be something that you read. It's not just a book of just sweet little sayings. It's the greatest book in the whole world. And, you know, a lot of people, they spend their time binge-watching a Netflix show. They'll spend their time trying to conquer an entire video game. They'll spend their time watching all the Hollywood movies. But the Bible has what all that stuff has. But it's so much better because it's, it's real and it's true. What I'm going to talk to you about today is the heavens. Now, you know, at the adventure of the Bible, you know, I'm not necessarily going to go in chronological order. Kind of just going wherever the Lord takes me with it. And, you know, with the, with the Bible, he says himself, you go here a little and there a little. And you got to use scripture with scripture. So many times we're going to go all around the Bible on this adventure. And remember our tour guide. Our tour guide is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But first this time, look at Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And you're going to see that word a lot in your Bible. Heaven. And many times it's not talking about the same one. So, ask yourself this question. How many heavens are there in the Bible? Do you know how many heavens there are? Now look at Colossians 3, 2. It says, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Now, all the heavens that are in the Bible are above your head. Which one do you need your affections on? That's the next question that we're going to answer. So how many heavens are in the Bible? Which one do you need your affection on? Well, I'll go ahead and tell you the Bible talks about three heavens. And there's just one that you need to have your affection on. In Psalm 148, 1 through 2, it says, Praise ye the Lord, praise ye, praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Heavens with an S, plural. So there's more than one heaven. Praise him in the heights. Praise ye him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all his hosts. So let's look at the three heavens. And for a good portion of people, this is going to be just a review just a very basic thing. Really, a, it's Bible 101, really. But if you're new to it, or maybe you just never thought about it, there are three heavens. Now, let's talk about the first heaven. The first heaven is, is our atmosphere. The first heaven is where the birds fly. In Genesis 1.20, if you're still in Genesis 1, look at Genesis 1.20, and this is going to show you the first heaven. In Genesis 1.20, it says, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. So, the first heaven is where the fowl fly. That's the birds. It's where the rain and snow fall. Look at Isaiah 55, 10. It says, For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So the first heavens where the birds fly, the first heavens where the rain and the snow fall. That's pretty easy. And, but this isn't the heaven... To have your affection on. You know the verse we started with. Colossians 3.2. 2, 
set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. So the first heaven's above, but it ain't the one you need to have your affection on. But some Christians, you know what? They got their heads in the clouds. They got their head in the clouds. They got all their affection on the first heaven or on things below the first heaven. Job 35, 5 says, Look into the heavens and see, and behold the clouds which are higher than thou. You know, the clouds above your head, that's the first heaven. And you got your head in the clouds, but you don't need your affections down here. You know, they can, like the Lord Jesus said, there's some people that can discern the weather. You know, their focus is on the first heaven. But they don't discern the signs of the times. In Matthew 16, 2 through 3, he answered and said unto them, When it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but ye cannot discern the signs of the times. You know, a lot of times, you know, I go when I go into work really early in the morning, it's dark outside. You know, I come out after work, and it's such a nice day. It's a sunny day. It feels so good outside. And, you know, a man that's not really focused on the Bible, focused on the Lord, he's just going to, when he sees that sunny day and how great it looks outside, He's just going to be thinking, life is great. This world is great. There's nothing bad going on. Everything's just fine. He's got everything focused down here. That's his focus is down here. You know, there's sometimes when I come out of work and it's a nice sunny day, and I'm thinking, why in the world is God allowing the weather to be this good? I should be getting sucked up by a tornado. I should be getting blown away by a strong wind or something. Why am I allowed to come out of work and it's such a nice sunny day and feels good outside? You know, why am I not getting scorched with great heat like they're going to get done in the tribulation? Why was I allowed to be, you know, born in the church age and not in the tribulation where the sun's going to be darkened and the moon's not going to give her light and uh, be scorched with great heat. You know, I'll start thinking those things. You know, if somebody doesn't think about the Bible, they're going to see the nice weather. They're going to think, they're going to think, you know, wow, the world is awesome. The world is great. Or when Maybe a tornado comes their way. They haven't been thinking about God or the Bible all this time. Maybe a tornado tears down their house, tears down their friend's house. They're going to finally think about God. And they may end up saying, well, if God is good, why did he allow that to happen? You see? Well, the Lord makes the sun to rise on the just and on the unjust. And you need to be thinking about God, not just what's going on under the first heaven. You know, in 2 Timothy 4.10, it says, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Demas had his affection on things below the first heaven. He, he wasn't going above that anymore. He may have loved walking out and looking up on a sunny day, looking up at the first heaven, seeing the birds flying, hearing the birds flying. You know, like when you go to the beach, it's so nice out. You can look up, you see the birds flying, you see the ocean. You see it's such a nice sunny day. And you can set your affection on that. And it makes you forget about your living in a present evil world. But you are living in a present evil world. There's so much wicked stuff going on below that first heaven. Unimaginable wicked stuff. Wicked stuff we can't even comprehend. 
you know, the average person like me and you, we can't even comprehend. We don't even, we can't even, you know, you don't even know because you're not involved in it. And a lot of times as a Bible believer, you know, I'm reading the Bible all day long. I'm at work all day long in a room, mostly by myself, just listening to preach and reading the Bible. And I'm so engulfed in that. You you forget all this wicked stuff going on all around you, even in your small town. And you can, when you, if you start getting your affection on things down here and you leave the scriptures, you'll start getting involved in all that wicked stuff going on down here. You know, some safe people are so consumed with their present life as well that they can't see past the first heaven. They won't look past that. They can't see past their job. They can't see past their family. They can't see past their hobbies or their car or their bank account. They can't see into those things that really matter because all their affection is under the first heaven. So the first heaven, that's where the birds fly. But that's not the heaven you need to have your affection on. Now, what about the second heaven? That's where the moon and the stars are. In Genesis 1, 16 and 17, it says, And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day. That would be the sun. And the lesser light to rule the night. There's your moon. He made the stars also. So you're, the God you're talking to, your guide on this adventure, he made the greater light, he made the lesser light, and he made the stars also. You're talking to a creator with the power to do stuff you can't even fathom. And, you know, you got safe people out there that if they ran into Taylor Swift, I mean, they would call themselves a Swifty. If they ran into her, they would just fall out on the floor crying. If they got tickets to her, be in the front row at her concert, they'd just be crying. Taylor Swift doesn't even know that who they are, but they got the God of heaven living inside of them, the God that made Taylor Swift, the God that made Patrick Mahomes or whatever his name is is living in them and they don't even talk to him. The God that made the greater light, the God that made the lesser light and made the stars also. And it says, And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. So that's the second heaven where the moon and the stars are. You know, you look up at night. You know, you see the first heaven by day. You know, you look up and you see the clouds and the and the birds flying. There's the first heaven. But now, like I'm at work right now, and it's dark. I'm in the parking lot at work. It's dark. I'm looking up, and I can see the second heaven. You see the first heaven by day. You see the second heaven by night. See that? So you can look up, you see the stars. That's the second heaven. But that's not the heaven you want your affection on. Now here's an example. You know, Demas was our example of the man that's got his affection down here. You know, on the first heaven or, or under the first heaven. Now here's an example of a man that's got his affections on the second heaven. In 2 Chronicles 33, 1 through 3, it says, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem, but did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. For he built again the high places, which Hezekiah his father had broken down, and those high places, it's not high enough, and he reared up altars for Balaam and made groves and worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. So this guy, Manasseh, 
He's got his affection on the second heaven. He's worshiping all the host of heaven, the sun, the moon, the stars, maybe some fallen angels too. He had his affections set on things above, like Colossians 3, 2 says to do, but he's just still not looking high enough. You know, NASA, they got their affections set on things above, but they're not looking high enough. Men are concerned with finding life on other planets, and they aren't even concerned with their own eternal life. They're not looking high enough. When you go out at night and look up and see the stars, it, it about knock you over sometimes. Like when I, if you're thinking biblically and you get home at night and you look up and you see all those stars, you start getting excited because you know the God that made those stars is living inside you and you're, you're like you're thinking of Abraham. You're trying to count the stars and you can't count them all. And you start thinking about getting your glorified body and you're going to be out in eternity and you're going to be able to teleport back and forth through all that whatever's out there. I don't, I don't, all the stuff that's out there. You're going to be able to teleport back and forth. You know, you're going to, it says the increase of his government and his kingdom shall be no end. So when earth gets full, there's going to be putting people on this other planet over here. And then when that gets full, they'll be putting people on this other planet over here. So, when you're thinking biblically, and you look up at the second heaven at night, you see all that? All them thoughts start running through your mind. And when you go out at night and look up at the stars, you shouldn't be more amazed with the stars than you are with the one who made the stars. That's showing you got your affection on things down here. You got a lot of people like that. They're more impressed with the creation than they are with the creator. What's more impressive than something that's created? The person that created it. In Psalm 19, 1, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. You know, he doesn't want you to be more impressed with the handiwork than you are with the hands that made it. But that's the second heaven. You don't want to be like Manasseh and just have your affections on all the host of heaven. You want it on the one who made it everything in there. Now, here's the third heaven. First heaven was where the birds fly. Second heaven, where the moon and stars are. Now you got the third heaven, where God resides. Second Corinthians 12, 2 through 4. It says, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, such an one called up to the third heaven. If you're still a skeptic on there being more than one heaven well Paul was caught up to the third one and he says I knew such a man whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell God knoweth how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which is not lawful for a man to utter and you know most Bible believers believe Paul's talking about himself when he says I knew such a man and Paul was caught up to the third heaven saw things that he couldn't even write down yet. And he says in Philippians 1.23, For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. So Paul had his affections on the right heaven. He's he got this desire to depart this present evil world and to be with Christ, which is far better. See, that that's, shows you Paul is our example of someone that has, has his affection on things above, and he's the one that wrote Colossians 3, 2. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Paul has his affections on the right heaven. Do you long for heaven? Do you long to be with the Lord? Do you long for the rapture? Well, if you do, you're going to get a crown. You know, the people that's got their affections on the third heaven... They got a crown coming to them. 
And in Psalm 48, 2, it says, Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. You know, up north, way up north, the third heaven. That's where your king sits. And in Hebrews 9, 24, it says, For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. The third heaven. That's where God is. And that's where the Lord Jesus Christ is sitting on the right hand of the Father. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, it says, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. You know, you would have a desire to depart and to be with Christ if you saw what Paul saw in the third heaven. And you're going one day. You're going to be there one day. It's, this is real. The scriptures are true. To be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. You know, you, you're looking at death all wrong. If you're saved, death is not bad. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And then you got to think, you know, you get up to eternity. And I don't know this for certain, but when you get up to when you get to eternity where the lord is maybe your your perception of how fast time goes is like it is how god sees it one day with the lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day so if you died right now we're so close to the end it may seem just like a few seconds and the rapture happens and then you're immediately met with your wife, with your kids, if they're saved, because time's going by so much faster. Now, to them on earth, it may seem like however long it's going to be until the rapture. Two months, two years, seven years, you know, I don't know how, when the rapture's going to be. But to you, it may just seem like a few seconds, because you, when you get to eternity, you may start viewing time like God how God sees time one day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day you know in the eyes of God Adam was just here days ago you know if Adam was here in 4000 BC and it's been 6000 years since he was here in the eyes of God he was just seeing Adam on earth six days ago you know, you start thinking about all this stuff, you start getting excited. You know, you're going to the third heaven one day. And, you know, a lot of people think, well, I'm, we're going to spend eternity in the third heaven. You know, that's not exactly true. You know, I believe if you die right now, you go straight to the third heaven. But you're coming back down. Because at the rapture, um, say that you die right now, and then the rapture happens Later on, the Lord's coming down to meet the saints in the air. Your soul's coming down with him, and then your body's going to come up out of the grave. You're going to get a new body. You're going to be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. And then we'll go back to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. But then you come back down at the second coming. You're going to you come back down to earth again in your glorified body. And then you're going to be in the millennium for a thousand years on the earth. And then, you know, you got the great white throne judgment where during the great white throne judgment, the earth and the heaven are fled away and the sinners are being judged standing on nothing. And then there's a new heaven and a new earth. And then you're going to have the Jews on the new earth getting their land you're going to have uh, the Gentile getting the second heaven, you know, populating the planets because they're, they're, they're not going to have glorified bodies. They're going to have natural bodies that they're still going to be reproducing. That's how the increase of his government and kingdom, there should be no end. Just like uh, the Jews from the tribulation and the millennium, 
their stars, uh, their, like he told Abraham, tell the stars, if thou be able to number them, so shall thy seed be. Their seed just keeps, his seed just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, more and more people. And then you're going to be in your glorified body. And look at this. This is your uh, home in eternity. Is in Revelation 21, 2 and 3. It says, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he would dwell with them, and they should be his people, and God himself should be with them and be their God. So New Jerusalem comes down from God out of heaven, and that's the eternal home of the born-again believer from the church age. So heaven... So you see, this is where your affection should be. It shouldn't be on the first heaven, like Demas. It shouldn't be on the second heaven, like Manasseh. It needs to be on the third heaven, like Paul. You die right now, you're going straight to the third heaven. In eternity, heaven comes down. You're going to live in New Jerusalem. Now, I don't believe you'll be just in the New Jerusalem. You'll be able to go anywhere you want to go, ministering to people. Now, let's talk about some more stuff when it comes to these heavens. Let's talk about the waters above the heavens. Now, like I said, this is an adventure. You know, we're, I'm, I'm going where, wherever the Lord puts on my heart to go. <clears throat> so you've got the first heaven where the birds fly. Above that, you got the second heaven where the sun, moon, and stars are. On top of that, you got the third heaven. But there are some waters above the heavens, specifically above the first and second heaven. And you got that sea of glass. You got that face of the deep. It says in Genesis 1, 6 through 8, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. You see, the firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament. And God divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. So we saw the firmament is where God would put the sun, moon, and the stars, remember? That was the second heaven. And that firmament, that's the second heaven, it divided the waters from the waters. And I'm not going to get into this too much, but see what happened was, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Lucifer rebelled. God flooded everything out back then, and the earth was underwater. So he made that firmament, and it divided the waters from the waters, and now the earth is in that second heaven and there's water below it and there's water above it so it says in psalm 148 4 praise him ye heavens of heavens and ye waters that be above the heavens and now that's just not that not just talking about the clouds that's talking about something above to at least two of the heavens because it says heavens so you have waters above the heavens plural so there is water above two of them and on top of that water is a sea of glass like a frozen block of ice in revelation 4 6 you read about it and it says before the throne there was a sea of glass like in a crystal revelation 15 2 i said now it says and i saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire so it looks like a frozen block of ice. In Job 38, 30, it says, The waters are hid as with a stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. So this sea is a picture of God's wrath separate, separating the sinner from God himself. You see, God separated the creation from himself because of sin. 
It says in Psalm 88, 7, Thy wrath lieth hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. So when you got saved, you were drawn out of many waters because the universe literally has a body of water separating the third and second heaven. In 2 Samuel twenty two seventeen, it says, He sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. So when you led someone to God, you became a fisher of men who was helping God draw people out of many waters. Mark 1, 17, Jesus said to them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. So imagine, I heard this illustration from Ruckman or somebody, but they're, they're talking about the third heaven. So, you know, imagine the Lord up in the third heaven and his, his throne is on that sea of glass and, you know, you got the face of the deep is frozen. And you know how when somebody goes ice fishing, they, they cut a hole in the ice, making a way to pull the fish up and to go ice fishing. You know, we, and think about us, you know, he's drawing us out of many waters. We had no way into heaven until the Lord made a way for us to get through. So it's like he made a hole in the ice, like somebody going ice fishing, and he's the door. John 10, 9, he said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. You know, when he, when he died on the cross, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. You know, Jesus' flesh is the veil. John 19 that soldier pitched him in his side, tore him, put a hole in him, and he's our. That's a picture of the door. He's your way in. And Jesus said, "I am the door." So, he cut a hole in the ice, and he's he's trying to get as many sinners on the hook as he can. You know, we are fishers of men trying to get other people on the hook, and. You know, this is a hook you want to get on. You know, what draws the fish to the hook? A worm. So the Bible refers to men as a worm. Psalm 22, 6, the crucifixion psalm, a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, it says, I am a worm. When Jesus Christ was on the cross, he became sin for us. And what did he say? What did he say before he got to the cross? He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Uh, the crucifixion psalm said, I am a worm. You see, Jesus Christ is the bait on the hook. He's trying to get you to take of him, believe on him, and you get on the hook. When Jesus ascended, think about this too, when he would have ascended, he would have went straight through this body of water above the second heaven. And it kind of makes you wonder if he stained it red on the way there. Because he took that, that blood up to the third heaven. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he shed his blood. The blood means something, unlike what a lot of people say. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. This was God's blood, according to Acts 20, 28. He purchased us with his own blood. Revelation 1, 5, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. He shed his blood on the cross, and when he ascended, he went up to the third heaven, applied the blood in the holy place up there after he would have went straight through that body of water. In Hebrews 9, 11 through 12, it says, But Christ being come an high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And when he ascended, he would have went straight through that body of water up there above the two heavens with his blood. So what you have with the Red Sea crossing is a picture of the saints leaving in the rapture, and going straight up through that body of water above the second heaven. 
and they had to go through the Red Sea to get away from the enemies, to get away from Pharaoh, remember? And we go through the red blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to get away from our enemies, the devil, the dragon. Also note, Pharaoh himself is called a dragon, just as our, our enemy is a dragon. In Ezekiel 29, 3, it calls Pharaoh a dragon. And the dragon's abode in his natural state is in the deeps above the second heaven. Job 41, 31 through 32, it says, He maketh the deep to boil like a pot. He maketh the sea like a pot of ointment. He maketh the path to shine after him. And one would think the deep to be hoary. So, the Bible is just an adventure. It's an amazing book. It'll take you here. It'll take you there. So, how many heavens are there? Three heavens. First heaven. You see by day, that's where the birds fly. Second heaven, you see by night, that's where the sun, moon, and stars are. And the third heaven, you see by faith, that's where God is. Which heaven do you have your affection on? Are you like Demas, and you're loving this present evil world, and you can't see past the first heaven? Are you like Manasseh, that's worshiping all the host of heaven? You enjoy looking at the stars and you enjoy the stars more than you do the one that made the stars. Or are you like Paul and you got your affection set on things above, not on things on the earth? You're in a straight betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Examine yourself. If you don't have your affection on the Lord, the third heaven, the rapture, you might need to fix your priorities a bit. You might need to go back to the scriptures and gob yourself in the scriptures in prayer and ask the Lord to put your affection on things above, not on things on the earth.